Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Mikael and Thomas, for organizing this uh, very nice uh, workshop. Uh, so I'm going to report on some work that has been done in uh, Mikael's group in, uh, in Aarhus, uh, where we uh, play with the uh, optical uh, lattice potential to control uh, so the, uh, the potential landscape and the normal modes of uh, small ion crystals. So you can see here crystals uh, having uh, up to actually eight ions, so it's a bit more than two, but you can decide whether you want to call it few or many body uh, physics. Um, <coughs> and so uh, the idea uh, or the motivation behind this work is to, uh, to combine uh, electric potential with, uh, with optical potential. So uh, one of, the, of our motivation was this uh, nice work by the Hamutasner group. Uh, uh, if you have uh, ions uh, in an optical uh, lattice, which, are also, which also interact together with the uh, Coulomb force, you have a nice uh, platform uh, where you have a competition between uh, uh, these forces, and, and this competition has been uh, exploited to study friction at the nanoscale by the group of Vlad and Vuletic, so uh, looking at ions sliding or, or, or being pinned in this uh, corrugated uh, uh, this combined potential. Uh, you can also use this optical potential to do uh, yeah, state-dependent force. Uh, many, uh, we've heard many talks uh, where uh, this is used. Or we also heard uh, yesterday by Tobias that you can even remove completely the electrical potential to do optical trapping of ions, which is good for instance to do uh, uh, hybrid uh, atom ion uh, physics. Um, and so we are uh, interested in some of these things. And so in the first uh, experiment, <coughs> Uh, that we did uh, some years ago, so we started out uh, with uh, pinning one, one ion uh, in, uh, in the optical potential uh, provided by a standing wave field inside an optical cavity. So we have a picture here of the inner pole trap that's used uh, in this experiment. So it's a fairly large trap, pretty much like the, the one uh, that Tracy showed, the first trap that Tracy showed. Uh, so a centimeter long cavity, uh, except now the, uh, the cavity is actually along the axis uh, uh, the longitudinal axis of the trap uh, and the trap calcium ion in it. Uh, so I should say that yeah, at the same time, so very similar experiments were done by, by the group of Tobias Schatz uh, with the freestanding uh, lattice and magnesium ions and also by Evan Vuletic with the eight carbon ions and this uh, structured trap that tracing was mentioning before. Uh, so in the, in the first experiments, so we have this, uh, so again, this, uh, this uh, moderate finesse a uh, cavity which has a thinness of 3,000 at 866 nanometers, so we operate on the uh, D2, D3 half to P1 half transition in, in calcium. So if we have an ion in this metastable D state here and we uh, apply, uh, uh, we inject uh, uh, a field uh, in, this, uh, in this cavity which is tuned to the red or to the blue, we, have, uh, we can have a strong optical potential which is, uh, it can be up to 20, 30 millikelvin. Uh, deep, uh, and it can be a uh, blue or red detune, which means that we can either pin the ion uh, in a place of low intensity, or if we are blue detune, or towards the intensity maxima if we if we red detune. And so the way uh, we look uh, actually in, uh, in these first experiments at the uh, the effect of the pinning was by looking at uh, when the ion was excited uh, by the lattice field. And when it's excited in P state, well, most of the time it will decay down uh, to the state by emitting a blue photon, which we can uh, look at on the camera. And because we are, uh, uh, if we are, if we have a blue detune lattice, so the ions is little intensity, so we have a, a low scattering rate as compared to the case where the ion is in a red detune lattice, uh, in which case the scattering rate would be higher for the same uh, intensity and, and depth of the lattice potential. So this is what we observed in the, in the first experiment. So you can see here, uh, if you take two uh, symmetrically uh, detuned lattice and you vary the intensity, you see a much higher scattering when the lattice is red detuned than when it's blue detuned. And uh, this difference so shows that there is, uh, that we pin the ion in the, in the lattice potential. Uh, one can also model uh, what happens by uh, looking at the, uh, the picture of the ion after Dr. Cooling uh, reducing this temperature and assuming that we adiabatically ramp up the lattice so one can calculate the energy distribution in the lattice and deduce what scattering rate to expect and that's the, uh, these lines here 
can see that they, uh, they match uh, well with the experimental uh, observations. Uh, so that demonstrates the, the pinning of, a, of an eye. Uh, but of course, it relies on some assumptions. If we trust this, uh, this model, then it also relies on uh, what kind of uh, energy distribution we, we assume we can have in the, in the, in the lattice. So to, uh, to get more information about this, so we also did some experiments where we decided to probe actually uh, the ion in, in the lattice. So the idea is the same, so we still have our ion and, uh, which is spinning inside the, the intracavity uh, optical potential, but we probe now the transition by uh, shining light from the side, 90 degrees from the cavity axis, uh, close to resonance with this transition. And so when we do this, we don't probe just the, uh, the bare ion, but we, bear, we probe the ion which is dressed by the lattice. Uh, so we probe states, or we probe transitions, which uh, of course depend on where the ion is positioned in, inside the, the optical potential. So we effectively probe uh, the dress states uh, that jean Bellibar and Claude Quentin Uji introduced many years ago. Uh, and the, these dress states uh, depend on uh, the detuning and, and of course the intensity of the lattice. And in our case, we work in a, in a regime where the lattice detuning is much larger than the radio frequency of the, uh, the limits of the transition, in which case we have just the usual AC star trip of, the, of this transition. So in the case where the lattice is blue detuned, so you get uh, a transition, and if the atom is at the bottom, you have a non-shifted uh, transition, you have no light shift. But as you go, uh, as you go uh, the side of the potential, then you start experiencing uh, uh, a reduced transition frequency, and that's the opposite for the for the for the red detuned lattice. So, uh, so this is yeah, just to summarize what the uh, what the frequency is uh, in, in both cases that you expect to, to probe. So, what do you expect to see? Well, if the ion moves sufficiently slowly, which it does, because the if you take even for the deepest lattice, the oscillation frequency is of the order of four, 4 megahertz, so it's still much uh, much shorter than the than the gamma of the transition, the scattering rate. So essentially, you can adopt a static picture to describe uh, the scattering of the ion in this uh, in this lattice. So if the ion has a certain position distribution in the, in the lattice, so you can calculate the scattering rate by averaging this uh, scattering rate, which includes the position dependent light shift. Uh, and multiply it by the, the position distribution of the ion in the lattice. So in a way, the scattering rate here now reflects what uh, position distribution is uh, in the lattice. And uh, what do you expect to see? So if you have, well, if you have no lattice, of course you probe just the bare transition, which has a line that's given by the, uh, the gamma of the transition. But if you have now a lattice which is a blue detune and you have an ion which is very cool, so very localized at the, at the uh, minimum of the potential, or in the case of the blue detune uh, uh, lattice, then you see essentially a non-shifted transition. So you see the same thing as if there was uh, no lattice. But if it's red detune, then you see a maximum light shift. Yeah, you experience a maximum light shift. So you see a, trend, uh, a spectrum which is shifted by the, the maximum light shift. Uh, if you now take an ion that's, uh, that's hotter, so that experiences uh, much, a much larger fraction of the optical potential, then of course you have to weigh, uh, to use, I mean, to weigh this, uh, this scattering rate uh, uh, using the, the formula I showed before. And what you see is a spectrum that reflects, so you see now that you get here uh, also uh, important contribution that you have blue. Uh, I mean, at lower frequency uh, uh, tunings, whereas if you're in a in a red in a red detune lattice, then you see a, a contribution from again lower frequencies, so closer to the bare resonance frequency. Uh, and so uh, you can also notice that these. Uh, so this is for a lattice that's uh, that's ten times the the Doppler uh, temperature here, you can see that the shifts can be very large, so 20 times or 10 times the, the line width of the transition. Uh, and the main reason for this is that if you think of, uh, of doing a spectroscopy of an ion in a lattice and you want to compare it to what you would do uh, traditionally, so if you do spectroscopy uh, of an ion that's, that's moving with, a, let's say, 
a certain uh, velocity that could be uh, Doppler velocity, well, the shift you would measure would be proportional to the velocity, so the square root of the, of the energy. If, uh, if you do it in a, in a lattice, so if I now probe from the side my ion that's trapped in this optical lattice potential, uh, which is much deeper than the, uh, than, the, uh, than the energy of the ion in the lattice, well, the light shift is essentially the, uh, the energy, so it's sensitive to the, uh, to the energy, not the square root of the energy. And if you put those things together, so the shift you would measure when you do spectroscopy in the lattice is related to the shift you would measure in the normal, uh, in the standard Doppler spectroscopy scheme uh, by a factor which involves the square root of the, the energy uh, uh, of the ion divided by the recoil energy, so that factor can be uh, quite large, which is explains why you have this, this enhancement or this broadening effect uh, uh, in, the, in the spectrum. And so, uh, well, actually, these uh, these kind of spectra were were observed uh, some time ago already uh, by by uh, a group of clone kinetic So at the time, what they had was a, a beam of cesium atoms that they sent through. Uh, uh, a standing wave optical potential, and you could see the atoms so channeling through these uh, uh, through these valleys formed by the, uh, the optical potential, and they could see uh, these kind of spectra that I discussed uh, earlier in the, in the, in the fluorescence of the, of the atoms. And so, so we basically well, we don't send the atom into the, the the standing wave. We have an atom that's sitting in our ion trap, and we raise the lattice adiabatically. So the experimental sequence is uh, the following. So we first pull and optically uh, prepare, uh, optically pump the atom to a, a specific state, and then we uh, inject the cavity with our lattice, which is either blue or, or red detuned. And then when the lattice is, has reached its maximum intensity, then uh, we measure. So we send a pump, uh, a probe pulse uh, from the side at the given uh, detuning and measure what uh, fluorescence uh, uh, we get, and then we can vary the detuning. Uh, yeah, things are a bit more complicated because what, what happens again is that the uh, the ion when it's excited will decay most likely to the to the estate, so it's actually not a close to level system, but an open to level system. But uh, well, essentially, uh, we can position ourselves in a, in a regime where this uh, the scattering rate is still linear with the probe power, uh, and so this. The, the, the things I was describing earlier still apply. Uh, and you can see that we observe a, a nice Laurentian uh, profile, uh, which is just slightly power broadened uh, when there is no lattice. And when there is a lattice, so we observe, so the, the, the spectra I was describing earlier, so the lattice is blue detuned, so we see maximum scattering around the, the bare resonance frequency uh, with a tail that extends at uh, negative detuning uh, because of the. Of the, of the negative uh, light shift contribution. And then when we are, uh, apply a, a red lattice, so we see uh, a maximum of scattering at twice the, the light shift. Uh, and uh, we can, yeah, you can fit these curves to deduce what is the, if you assume a temperature, uh, a thermal distribution of the ion in the lattice, to assume what the, the temperature of the ion is in the lattice, and check that it's consistent also with what we expect from uh, the initial temperature of the ion before we, uh, we apply the lattice. So this, uh, so this technique, uh, I think, is, is interesting because that can, in principle, provide us with more with useful information of uh, the energy distribution of the ion in the lattice. Uh, that could be useful when we go to, uh, to more ions, for instance. So one could uh, yeah, so measure uh, if one can uh, probe each ion individually, so kind of have information on on the distribution, on the energy distribution of each ion in, in the chain, for instance. Uh, the other, another application is that if you have a red lattice, again, that you see this, uh, uh, this spectrum is shifted towards uh, uh, high frequencies, uh, and uh, this maximum shift is given by the light shift, and it's a quite big shift, so it, in terms of, uh, if you look at the numbers, so it's 40 megahertz per, per millikelvin. Uh, of lattice depth, uh, so it's quite a large shift. So it can be used to calibrate very precisely uh, the uh, the intensity that experienced by the atom inside the, the cavity. So 
instead of relying on the knowledge of the error transmission and measuring the, the light that's transmitted by the KVT, here you, you get you get access directly to the intensity that's really experienced by the atoms. So you can, in principle, calibrate your lattice intensity um, absolutely. All right. So this was with one one ion. So that's the tools we have for one ion. But we also did experiments with uh, more ions. So, for instance, making a a string of, uh, of eight ions and applying this <coughs> potential. And we can observe again the scattering here, we observe the, the scattering from the lattice, and again see the same kind of behavior, so this asymmetric uh, uh, scattering, whether we are detuned to the red or to the blue of the transition, uh, showing that we, uh, we pin the eight ions are pinned uh, simultaneously uh, in, uh, in near the potential uh, maximum. A minima, sorry. Uh, we did it also for various crystals, so various strings of ions, uh, up to eight ions, but also with uh, multidimensional crystals, so for instance, a zigzag crystal, so a 2D, uh, a 2D chain of ions, or even a, a 3D crystal, so here it's actually a six ion crystal, so which consists of two, uh, I mean, two triangles which are 90 degree, uh, whose planes are 90 degrees from each other. An octahedron crystal, if you want to give it a name. Uh, and we observe again that at the highest, so this is the scattering, whether you red or blue detune, at the highest at the depth we could achieve in the, in the experiments. Uh, and we also observe pinning of, of all the ions, so in this, uh, in this, uh, in this that is potential. Uh, one thing which is interesting is that, uh, well, if you look at this, uh, this, the, this ion here, uh, which is off axis, so it's about 15 microns away from the from the trap axis, there is no, where there is no micromotion, so this one already uh, experiences substantial micromotion, such that the radial energy, the mean, uh, the average energy of the, the micromotion in the radial direction is almost a Kelvin, so it's way higher than the lattice uh, depth, uh, uh, but still, it's still possible to do this, uh, to, to pin the ion in, in the other direction, which means that the coupling of the of this radial micromotion uh, doesn't perturb, at least uh, for these crystals, the, the localization mechanism. And that's, uh, that's, that's interesting because uh, that makes hope that maybe we can use this to, uh, to, uh, to control better, larger Coulomb crystals. So you have here pictures that uh, Nikkei took some years ago of, so this is a 3D uh, crystal, so almost a spherical crystal, so you only see the, the equatorial plane here. Uh, with a few uh, yeah. 2,700 ions. And uh, what one can observe in, in these uh, pictures is that, well, you can have different uh, structures. So John Bollinger also mentioned these, the existence of these different crystalline structures for the for large 3D crystals. They can be uh, BCC, uh, like, like in this picture, or FCC. <coughs> Uh, but they can also change in time, that's what we see in the experiments, that many of these structures are very close in, in energy uh, 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 together, and are very close to each other in energy, so thermal, small thermal fluctuation can just make these, uh, this crystalline uh, structure to, to change. We have here an example of a picture where there, there is probably a, a BCC and FCC structure being present at the, at the same time. And so this is what happens if, yeah, if they are uh, trapped uh, in, a, well, in, a, in a conventional RF trap. But so we uh, were interested in seeing what happens if we can put, use an optical lattice and use the optical lattice to, uh, to pin, uh, to try to stabilize these structures. And so, uh, so this we did in, in simulations, or Peter Horak did in, in simulations. So he looked at uh, crystals here also with a, like a thousand of ions where he initialized the core uh, structure of the ions to be, for instance, BCC, and look at what happens if you put planes, uh, if you put an optical lattice whose planes are matched with the, with the structure uh, of, the, of the crystal. And so increasing the optical potential shows that, at least in the simulation, that this stabilizes uh, the crystalline structure uh, of the crystal. And uh, even better, it's, it's actually possible to, uh, to reversibly uh, change, uh, switch from one uh, structure to another. Uh, so you can see it in, in this cartoon. So actually, if you start with the, the BCC structure here, and you actually stretch 
uh, the crystal, so you can do that by changing the trap frequencies in the right way, stretch the crystal here, so this, uh, this unit cell here becomes this one, so you go from BCC to FCC and you can do the other way around. And so uh, in the simulation, if you do this uh, adiabatically, you can so change efficiently the structure from one to, to another reversibly. But in these simulations, there was no uh, micro-motion uh, included, so of course it's, it's always uh, interesting to know. Uh, well, it was a good thing, a good first step to see in the experiment with small crystal that at least the micro-motion didn't kill everything, and that there is hope that maybe one can uh, do this kind of thing. Uh, so use an optical potential to stabilize the structure of, of, larger, of larger crystals. The other thing that's, uh, that's also uh, interesting is to look at what happens to the normal modes of uh, this multi ion crystal. So here you have a picture again of the eight ion string uh, that we demonstrated the, the pinning of. Uh, and here are simulations of the, the mode frequencies uh, of this chain when we uh, apply, I mean, when we vary uh, the intensity of the, of the lattice depth, if you want to vary the lattice vibrational frequency. And uh, you can see that in the beginning, so the, the modes are quite spread. And when we apply the lattice along this axis, so all the actual modes could converge. And at high lattice frequencies, it's understandable because now the atoms don't see each other anymore. They only see the, the lattice uh, potential. So they all converge uh, towards the same the frame frequency. Uh, <coughs> so that could be useful if you want to do uh, sideband cooling of, the, of these modes. Uh, and this is very related to some work by, by Giovanna, where they also looked at what happens in a, in a, in a cavity here when you go from the uh, sliding to, to pinning transition, that uh, the modes which are initially very spread and uh, for which it's very difficult to do result sideband cooling uh, cluster together, that is the longitudinal modes, so that you can uh, more efficiently cool them. And well, here, this is even the, the cooling by the cavity. Uh, so in our case, we could uh, well, yeah, either use the cavity or use another laser to do a cooling of, the, of these modes uh, together. So that would be also an alternative to EIT cooling. Um, <coughs> what would be even more interesting uh, would be if we had a, a stronger cavity coupling. Uh, <coughs> so one could go to a regime where, what actually the uh, now the the back action of the cavity field onto uh, the position of the ion would be uh, important so that the, uh, the deformable substrate that the cavity potential form is also uh, dependent on, on, the, uh, on the scattering of photons by, uh, by the atoms. And so there is uh, also uh, some nice uh, prediction of the different regimes you could have in that regime that requires having a stronger coupling uh, per ion uh, than what we have at the moment something also that could be investigated uh, in, this, in this system. So, so this was for, for a chain. So it's also interesting to look at what happens if we now play with the dimension of the crystal and if we take this, uh, this four-ion zigzag crystal, so it's a, it's a 2D uh, crystal, uh, and if we look at the evolution of the, the normal modes, so you can see again the same, uh, the same kind of, of behavior as before. So we have uh, clustering of the longitudinal modes uh, when the lattice uh, intensity is increased. You see also that the radial modes, uh, which initially are quite spread, also become more uh, clustered. So that could also be helpful in, uh, again, if you want to resolve side and cool them. But you can also see there are some interesting uh, avoided crossing between some of the modes. Uh, and if I look at what happens, uh, so this is here, uh, this mode, mode 2, and the blue one is mode 3. And if you start, mode 2 is essentially uh, a longitudinal mode uh, to start with, whereas mode 3 has both longitudinal and radial components. But it's quite radial, and you can see as you increase the lattice, actually mode 2 becomes uh, completely radial mode, whereas mode 3 uh, become a longitudinal mode at, a, at high lattice frequency. So one could imagine uh, using uh, using the optical lattice to uh, to do transition and maybe adiabatic switching uh, or adiabatic transfer of excitation between these modes uh, and engineer an interesting 
the dynamics between uh, between various folks. Uh, and actually, we you can also see the same kind of dynamics. So now that's for the three D uh, crystal. Uh, it's, uh, it's even more more complex. So it's something we need to uh, to investigate in more detail. But there's also uh, all of these interesting possibilities to engineer uh, uh, interesting dynamics between the between the different modes. And so, uh, so if we want to use uh, these techniques, so the <coughs> so one 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 thing we would like we would be interested in doing would be uh, to do experiments very much like uh, what Ham Daphna has done. Uh, with a string of ions and study heat transport in, uh, for instance, in a chain or in multidimensional crystal. So by, for instance, by exciting one end of the chain and looking at uh, what happens to the uh, outer ions, so can, so can one study the, uh, the transfer of energy in, in that chain? And so there it would be very interesting for an optical lattice to control the, uh, the transfer of heat in that chain, because that would be strongly dependent on on the optical potential. Uh, actually, uh, some very interesting uh, work by uh, by the group of Tang and H. Tauber, uh, already showed that if you have this kind of 2D and these big uh, zigzag crystals where you can have defects, so Tobias already mentioned those defects, uh, these defects and uh, where you are in the, depending on your, if you are in the pinning or in the sliding uh, phase transition really affects the transport of energy in this chain. Uh, so here, there's no lattice, it's just the, uh, uh, the dimensionality of the crystal that is for you, but it could also be interesting to have a lattice here to, to, study, uh, to study this kind of, of energy transport. There were also some very nice experiments in, in the group of uh, Dmitry Matsukovich uh, with the three ions looking at uh, heat transport and refrigeration mechanism. Uh, and in this case, he was exploiting the intrinsic nonlinearity of the cool interaction in, in the trap uh, to couple uh, different modes of normal lines, so doing parametric amplification, for instance, of the modes uh, of, of free ions. Uh, here, the optical lattice would provide us a way to do this in a maybe more flexible way. One could also engineer uh, this kind of uh, multiple mode interaction by choosing correctly the, uh, the, optical, the optical potential depth and then cutting frequency. And so, uh, and the last thing we also very interested in, in studying are these uh, two component crystals, and since it's on the post of the conference, so I felt that I had to show this picture. Uh, so to use, so here is a picture of a, of a two component crystal, uh, uh, two calcium isotopes, uh, which are trapped and uh, which are trapped together, and so these uh, would be very interesting to look at. Also, what uh, I mean, how to control the the, the potential uh, landscape and the normal modes of these uh, crystals uh, using the, the, the optical lattice. We know that these uh, the presence of the, uh, this other component uh, strongly affects the, the structure of the inner component here. Uh, so that would. And I think this optical potential would uh, give us some more tools to study these, uh, this kind of, of structure. Right, and so I would uh, yeah, finish by uh, thanking the people. So uh, Mikael is uh, the main person between, behind this work, and a lot of the experiments were done by Thomas Lopet, who is a, a postdoc, and, and who also was really from uh, MIT originally. And we also had some Nice uh, theory support. So Mathieu Marcian was doing some molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, Peter Horak also, and uh, we also had some uh, <laughs> yeah, many people. Uh, and we also had some support with, from Hagai Landa for the uh, normal mode uh, simulation. Thank you. With, with this equally spaced ion string, uh, you could do a Newton's cradle sort of experiment, right? With, I, I think you can't do that with an unequally spaced string. But you know, you know what I mean, where, where you excite one to a very large amplitude and then the only thing that happens is the other on the end of the string, other end of the string, 
excites and then it's back and forth? Yeah, well, so it would depend really on the depth of the optical potential. Uh -huh. if, you, if you really remove the, the coupling between them, they would feel it at some point. Yeah, but you should should be able to get a regime where, where yes. this works. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know what it would be good for, but it would be cute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm curious about what controls the, the BCC structure to the FCC structure, something like this. Well, I mean, when you have many ions, there are many configurations which have almost the same uh, the same energy. So they're very close in energy together. I mean, typically, uh, in 2D, I saw the world our kind of triangular structures. Uh, so if you have an infinite, uh, if you have an infinite 3D crystal, I think the ground state would be a BCC structure. But uh, in practice, uh, while well, you have finite size effect, also the cooling in the trap uh, really would determine what structure you have. And that these structures will, will vary a lot. I mean, could, things, could, similar things. could you go to that slide where you were talking about the 3D? Uh, just, just follow up key ones. Yeah. It, it, you this one. Yeah. yeah so, so were you tuned? So, so first of all, what? What's the time scale that these changes occur? I think these images were taken, but I think in 100 millisecond exposure time. <coughs> uh, so they're, well, it's... So yeah. in less than a second, it was, it was a change. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and many times they would change much faster, so it's actually a, a bit of a... It's hard work to get these pretty pictures, uh, because usually they would change much faster. And then if you go a couple slides, towards the end of your talk where you have the, there, oh, the, no, you went too far, back, back. Yeah. there. So I, in, in your figures A and B where you're tuning between a, I guess FCC and BCC structure, mm -hmm. it, I, I, I guess I wasn't clear what you're tuning there. Are, are you tuning um, the spacing of the optical lattices? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you, you could do that. In practice, it's not so easy. It's much easier to tune the trap frequency but to stretch the crystal in the right way. So if you stretch it by the right, uh, like in this picture, you can see it's larger this way, then this becomes the unit set, and that's a BCC structure. And you don't need to stretch it by much to go from one structure to another. And in general, to, to make this happen, you have to have a lattice well, the confinement which yeah. is how, how strong. How, how well, that's, that's on this. So in the simulation, so we simulated the Doppler cooled ions, so you know, millikelvin after millikelvin temperature, and just the pile that is of a few millikelvin, and that's already enough to stabilize it. And that's what we have also in the experiment. But again, that's without micro motion in the simulation. So in the practice, I take it uh, if there had been something new since the large two isotope ion crystal, you would have mentioned it. Is there uh, anything new on that since that? If paper? we measured more on uh, on large white crystals, no. If you add these optical potentials to your cooling crystal, and some ions, sometimes like in this picture fit into the optical lattice and some don't, and then you get a uh, different normal mode spectrum. Is it then there a possibility to just talk to these modes? And are there gaps so that you can address the, the ions that are living within this potential uh, in, uh, in contrast to the ones that are outside? Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by okay, outside so the potential. So you have, for example, in this case, but this is a huge crystal now, you yeah. overlap with the optical uh, potential, right? And this okay, is how so you, you say you stabilize, mm -hmm. kind of, or you try to stabilize. But it looks like uh, you have, for a certain array, you get the eyes pinned to your optical potential. Oh, yeah, I think the, the colors here is not the, uh, just the ions talking to the lattice. It's just the initial ions that were in that is just the, the core. In. It's still just the core ions that we looked at. Uh, in ah, the simulation, okay. but the lattice was everywhere. But you're right, in practice you could also, if you have a very large crystal, you would only address part of the crystal. But then you would still talk to the other ones by the coolant interaction. Uh, so that's also what happens when you divide crystals. Uh, yeah, and then what happens is, is interesting. I don't know. Uh, 
Yes, so sure. So if we if we take a string and we prepare some ions and some that would also change uh, yeah. we could do the same kind of tricks to most of you guys do some of the quantum tricks. So there was this proposal also to use uh, the state dependence of uh, in a, in a chain to control the flow of heat. Uh, I think uh, Captain Premio and uh, it's so very it's strongly dependent on the dimension. So there you could use it. Yeah. Or you could use make a river a river line. <laughs> so this is uh, session and be back after the coffee.